I'm Edie Lodge and I'm here at the Hub Culture Pavilion. It's Davos, it's 2018, and I am joined by an amazing guest, Eugene Chung. Thanks very much for coming along. Thank you for the invitation. Founder and CEO of Penrose Studios. Now, this is what you do, you do VR. And when I was reading uh, a blog that you recently wrote, you talked about the difference between presence and storytelling. And I'm really fascinated by that. Tell me a little about that and what, how VR plays into that. Sure, certainly. So um, over the course of thousands of years as a species, we've, cre we've told stories, whether it's around a campfire or in a movie theater or on a stage. Um, what's interesting is that now we have this brand new medium emerging of virtual and augmented reality, and there are different ways to consume it. But what's different about virtual reality as opposed to something like a movie is that you feel much more like you are uh, in the experience itself. It surrounds you and you're a part of it. Mm. And what that means is that creates this incredible challenge for storytellers. Because if you think about the way in which we traditionally tell stories, we tell stories by kind of getting outside of our own bodies, right? So when you're in a movie theater and it's very dark, mm. and you're watching a movie, when someone rattles a key next to you mm -hmm. or opens their smartphone, you suddenly feel like you are... You snapped out of you it. You snap out of it. And that, then you feel present in your body. Mm. And when that occurs, it's actually really difficult to tell a story in a very effective way. Mm. So one of the great challenges of this medium of VR is how do you take that ancient old thing we've done uh, for thousands of years, storytelling, and combine it with the idea of being physically present? Uh, because that storytelling part of the mind often shuts off. Mm. And so we're excited to kind of explore that. And that's one of many frontiers we're exploring at Penrose Studios um, in creation of our stories and our technology. And I know that through this creation of stories combined with the technology, you've been inspired by opera because your father was a, an opera singer. So tell me about how that's changed your perspective and what you've done. Absolutely. So opera was a huge part of my life growing up and what I noticed that was very interesting was I grew up in the suburbs of Virginia near Washington DC and when I looked around at the neighborhood kids I found that none of them really watched opera. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't really know what it was, they never really uh, kind of watched it. They would play video games, they'd watch movies or they'd watch television but opera really wasn't on their regular media diet and I found this to be odd because mm -hmm. my father is an opera singer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I ended up going back to the history books and trying to understand whether this was ever at all relevant. And of course I found, you know, 150 plus years ago, in the middle of 1800s, was the apex of opera as an art form. Mm -hmm. Everyone thought that nothing could ever get beyond this. This had the best stories, the best characters, right. the best music. Um, and of course, uh, what happened was in the few decades later in the 1890s, the very first movie picture cameras came about. And uh, the first uh, creators of movies came about. Mm. And uh, that, of course, ended up displacing opera as the main, as, and, uh, and the stage play as the main art form. And I saw that and I was very inspired. I mean, it, it was such a vast transformation, if you think about it, that we remember the names of new media companies at the time, mm -hmm. such as names like Paramount Pictures and Disney and Fox, but we've completely forgotten the names of these old media companies, which were the biggest media companies of right. the day. They had the biggest stars, the biggest production budgets, the mm. biggest shows, and uh, yet somehow 120 years later, we don't remember their names, but we do remember the names of companies like Paramount Pictures, mm -hmm. which were at the vanguard of a brand new art form and a brand new sort of way of expression. And uh, we were inspired by that. And I was always looking for when you'd see the next art form transformation. And I found it several years ago in virtual reality. And we've been creating uh, and building ever since. So give me an example of something you've done. And I know that uh, one of your latest projects has an element of doing good through virtual reality. Tell me about that. Yeah. So I think virtual and augmented reality have this incredible power to do good in the world. Um, like any other technology, it also, of course, has the, the opposite effect as well. But I think it's all up to us as humans to use it in the correct way. If you think about fire, an ancient invention that we've done. You know, it can be used for good, like cooking food. Mm -hmm. It can also be used for, you know, you know, burning down things. Mm -hmm. So it's up to us to make sure we use that and channel that uh, in the right way. For the works that we've created at Penrose, we've created things like Arden's Wake. Arden's Wake is one of our latest virtual reality productions. It's in fact the third film we've created uh, in Penrose. It's mm -hmm. an animated CG, fully real time CG. Fully uh, computer graphics, right? Yeah, full, an fully animated, fully computer generated world. And the advantage of computer generated virtual reality is that unlike live action, you can actually move around the entire space, mm -hmm. and it becomes alive uh, right in front of you. And uh, Arden's Wake is an interesting concept. There's sort of two aspects to it that I think really relate to the human condition. Uh, the very first aspect is on sort of a macro level, and that's uh, an environmentalist aspect. You know, Arden's Wake is set in this post-apocalyptic ocean mm -hmm. you know, where the sea levels have risen and we see this world that's, that's emerged. Uh, on a very personal front, Arden's Wake is a story about a young woman who loses her, all her family down into the ocean 
and she has to go and look for them. And mm. throughout that process and journey, she finds and discovers who she is as a person and learns about how to sort of, you know, get, uh, get rid of and socially emerge from a potentially uh, a negative relationship that she has. And so I think on those two levels, it's really interesting. We're targeting one thing that's kind of very societal mm. and another thing that's sort of deeply personal. And uh, we think both are very relevant to uh, humans. How far away are we from a fully haptic mm. experience so where you feel it uh, as, and you know, sort of around your shoulders and your hands, wherever it is, as yeah. well as being immersed in the sight and sound? Sure, I think that's a really excellent question. We talk a lot about uh, the full immersive nature of VR. Mm -hmm. Right now, sight and sound definitely predominate um, the development and honestly most of the development uh, capital that's going in. But of course, there are multiple other aspects. There's uh, smell, there's mm. the haptics, there's mm -hmm. other things that we're gonna have to develop um, as, we, as we move along. Um, I think that right now, one thing that's interesting is the hand controllers that come with mm -hmm. uh, headsets such as these that we have on the table. Uh, actually give you a pretty good proxy for what it's like to have you know touch capabilities mm -hmm. inside of virtual and augmented reality. I think eventually over time we'll get much more advanced things like gloves and eventually potentially you know direct Suits. neural inputs right and things like that and I think that will lead to much more powerful experiences but I'd say that right now the state of VR and the amount of technology that we have built into these systems mm. used to not too long ago just even a few years ago would have cost us, you know, hundreds of thousands, potentially mm. millions of dollars, uh, and yet now they're available f on the order of hundreds of dollars to any consumer around the world. And I think that's an incredible, uh, that's an incredible sort of leapfrog for the product and technology. We'll end it there, but as a, a fan of Ready Player One, I'm, I'm ready for it. I'm ready for the full haptic experience. <laughs> Eugene, thank you so much for stopping by the Hub Culture Studio here in Davos in the snow, and I'm Edie Lush.